record to the cloud. All right, so you folks see this record button up at the very top here. You guys seeing this? Where it says recording? Yes, I can see the recording. Yeah. Okay, okay, so for some reason, I, last time I inadvertently hit it, who knows what happened. If you see it not recording, please tell me. First thing I want to do is share my screen here. And in fact, what I'm going to do, I want to read this. Um, first thing I want to show you is folks often ask me, well, not ask me, but the day of the test, they just can't remember. It's called an exam, but in Canvas, on this left hand menu here, this is, doesn't not say exam, it says quizzes. If you've taken a course online before, you're aware of this, so please. But I had somebody ask me the other day, so it's quizzes right here. All right, you're going to be clicking on exam number one. And here's the directions. You know, it starts tomorrow at 11 o'clock. It goes from 11 tomorrow to Wednesday morning at 11. You've got 150 minutes to do it. But once you start, you got to do it in one sitting. So make sure that you have at least a couple of two and a half hours or whatever. Yeah, at least a couple of hours to block out because you can't stop it and then go do something and come back. Once you begin, the clock starts ticking. And the other thing for security measures, once you answer the question, you cannot repeat, cannot go back. So make sure you're pretty positive of the answer that you um, that you've got there. So there it is. Tomorrow morning at eleven o'clock, you've got to Wednesday, eleven o'clock in the morning. So let me stop sharing that. I'm still recording, and ah, uh, here we go. What I've done here with these two PowerPoints, actually, yes, yeah, two PowerPoints, is I've I've condensed them to just focus in on the things that you need for tomorrow. I'm not going to go through the entire PowerPoint. You've already watched that. So, first of all, what is what is stats? What's about What is probability? Science of uncertainty. First of all, probability is a number that represents the likelihood of the occurrence of an event whose outcome is unknown. All right. Now, you have experiments. An example of an experiment would be rolling a die, picking a man or a woman out of a group, uh, picking a club out of a deck of cards. Um, you get a bag of marbles and your probability of you know, pulling out a red marble. Those are experiments. The outcomes are the results. If I'm rolling a die, well, my results could be a one, a two, a three, a four, a five, or a six. If I'm rolling two die, of course, you got 36 different possibilities, a two all the way up to a, um, a six and a six and a 12. An event would be, you know, could be rolling an even die, rolling a, an odd number of an even die, rolling an odd uh, number, rolling an even number, or it could be, let's say, what's the probability of me rolling a number bigger than three or less than five? All right, experiments, outcomes. Here's the key thing with probability. Probabilities will always be a number, but they'll be between zero and one. You can't have a probability of an event being a negative number and a probability of something happening can't be bigger than one. One is a sure thing, all right? I'm sorry. Yeah, one's a sure thing. Zero means that thing cannot happen. Probabilities range between zero and one. They're, not, they're never negative and they're never bigger than one. In reading, you read P of A right here. P of A is read probability of A. If the probability of something happening A is one, it's certain to occur. If the probability of something is zero, it cannot happen, all right? No chance in heck. Probability of me jumping on a spaceship tonight at uh, 7.30, zero. I'm not jumping on a spaceship, I don't think, all right? Um, something that's one, probably turns dark tonight. Yeah, it's a sure thing. Please don't tell me you're in Greenland or in Alaska. You know, you're not, okay? Between zero and one. Three ways of assigning probability. First way is by intuition. You know, we talk about woman's intuition, whatever. I, you know, I got a feeling that this is going to happen. And I think, you know, I got a feeling my uh, ankle has bothered me. I think it's going to rain. Well, <laughs> on an exam, I can't ask you anything to deal with your intuition because everybody has a different intuition. That's a way of figuring out probabilities. What we rely on is number two and primarily number three, using what's called relative frequency. 
hey, how many times has something happened in the past over the total number of times? There's an example in, you know, in um, one of the uh, worksheets that says 375 people at this particular car at college wear correct event lenses and there's 500 students. What's the probability that you pick somebody at random and they wear glasses? Well, it'll be 375 over 500 relative frequency. We make our living with the third way, which is same. It's almost like number two. We're setting up a fraction. Is Mexican, and if I assume he likes to eat, my sister will be like, "Why?" Because he's Mexican. Jack, will you shut your mouth? You shut your thing off, Jack. Thank you. We make a living with number three, equally likely outcomes, things that have the same chance of um, popping up. Here again, it's a fraction. It's the number of total favorable outcomes over the number of total outcomes. For instance, if I roll a die, there are six numbers on a die. What's the probability of me rolling a five? Well, favorable is only one five. Total outcomes, there's six. Probability of me rolling a five is one chance out of six. So I can't ask you anything on intuition, but the majority of problems will deal with number three, and some of them will obviously deal with relative frequencies. Both of these are, are solved by setting up fractions. Here's an example of intuition. Consider the following example, determine how the probability was assigned. You get a sports announcer, maybe on the Olympics, says, hey, Sheila, your times have really been good. She's getting better and better. Um, the track today is great. The wind is within range. You know, I think this woman says, I got a 90%, I think 90% chance that Sheila's gonna break the uh, world's record. But what she's doing is she's basing this on intuition. As far as what she's watched with Sheila, she's seen her race, her times have been getting better and better. Intuition, all right? I can't very really ask you that because we all have different intuitions. Here's that one with the glasses. You got 500 students at the Hudson College. They were surveyed, 375 wear glasses, all right? Hey, what's the probability that if I select a student at random from this college, this person wears glasses? Well, it's relative frequency, 375 out of a total of 500, all right, it's a fraction. And then they change the fraction obviously to a percentage relative frequency. Here's the idea. If it happened X amount of times in the past, you can assume it's gonna happen X amount of times in the future, 375 over 500. Henry figures that if he guesses, now guesses is a really important word here because if, you're, if Henry had studied, all right, and he's taking a true false question, the probability of him getting it correct is better than 50-50. If he studied, you would think the probability of getting it right, like 95%, 99 maybe even 100%. All right, so he's guessing. He doesn't have any idea. He's taking, he's guessing at a question he's never studied. So it's 50-50, all right? There are two outcomes. Either he's correct and true and false, or he's, um, he's wrong. Since he's, a guess, since he's guessing, we, seem to, we assume the outcomes are equally likely. There's two choices, either the answer is true or, it's, or the answer is false, all right? Only one of them is correct. So the number of favorable outcomes is one, number of total outcomes, two, true and false. He has a 0 0.50 or a one half chance of getting it correct. Three ways of figuring out probability. Here's the big deal, <laughs> all right? The sum of the probabilities of all these simple events in the sample space must be equal to one. Take the die. Probability of me rolling a, a one is one over six, a two, one over six, a three, one over six. Me rolling a four, one over six. Probably me rolling a five, one over six. Probably me rolling a six, one out of six. If I take one six and I add it up six times, guess what? I get one. It's a sure thing that one of those numbers is going to come out. So, we can use this fact to determine the probability that an event will not occur. For instance, if you think you have a 0.65 chance of winning a tennis match, you assume that your opponent has a 0.35 chance of winning. How did I get 0.35? I took one. I subtracted 0.65. I come up with a difference of 0.35. Notice 0.65 and 0.35 have to add up to one. The complement of an event, A, is the event that A does not occur. In our textbook or in our course here, we use an A with a bar over it. This is the notation to designate the complement of something happening. So here's some examples here. Here's just a little bit of algebra. The probability of something happening plus the probability of the complement of that thing happening is gonna be equal to one. Either it happens or it doesn't happen. The sum of the probabilities is one. Using a little of algebra, 
the probability of A happening is one minus the probability of the complement, and the probability of the complement is one minus the probability the event happens. He is getting back to that rolling a die, probably me rolling a four is one chance in six. Well, if there's only one four on the die, there are five numbers that are not four. The one's not a four, the two's not a four, the three's not a four, the five's not a four, the six is not a four. There are five numbers on a die that aren't fours. Notice one six plus five six, the complement of rolling a four has to equal one. If the probability of something happening is 0.7, the probability of it not happening is one minus 0 0.7, 0 0.3. Here again, the probability of something happening is 0.15. Probability of not E is one minus 0.15 would be 0 0.1, uh, 0 0.85. We're gonna talk a little, a little bit later on about um, the probability of at least one success. The probability of one sex, at least one success means one or more. All right, and we really have an issue with this and we how, how we solve these problems, we use the complement rule. The complement of at least one is none, all right? So if I'm ever asked to find, and we do a couple, we'll do a couple of these problems. If I'm asked to find a probability of at least one success, I take the whole number one and I subtract the probability of zero successes. The complement of at least one is none. And right about now, we have no way of solving these other than using this complement rule, all right? Uh, critical thinking here, um, consider the uh, experiment of rolling a die, uh, I'm sorry, tossing a coin three times. Each coin has a possible outcomes of be being a heads or a tails. First thing he does, he asks us to list all the simple events. And then he says, hey, what's the probability that all three coins come up heads? And then finally, um, what's the probability that there will be at least one tail? Well, here's the deal here. When I'm rolling a coin three times, all right, I have two outcomes for the first. Um, I'm flipping a coin, excuse me. I'm flipping a coin three times. I have two outcomes for the first, could be a heads or a tails. I have two outcomes for the second flip, heads or a tails. I have two outcomes for the third flip two times two times two is eight. The sample space consists of eight events. Could be all three heads, could be a head and a head and a tail, a head, a tail, and a head. You see all the different arrangements. Probability that I flip this coin three times and I get a head, a head, and a head. Well, there's only one favorable outcome. One out of a total of eight. I have a one in eight chance of rolling, uh, flipping the coin and getting three heads. Hey, what's the probability that I have at least one tail? Well, I can count them here, all right? I have at least one tail here. I have one there. I've got two, which is at least one. I got one there. I got two, which is at least one. I got two there. I got two there. Seven out of these eight were had at least one tail. So the probability of at least one tail is one minus the probability of three heads. Well, one minus three heads is one minus one eight, which is seven eights. But we can see it. We can actually count them and you know see the seven the reason that we use this little formula is that well you know setting up the sample space with three flips of a coin is easy but what if i roll a coin let's say six times toss the coin or flip the coin it'd be a heck of a job to do it so we rely on this at least one the probability of at least one is one minus the probability of none not getting any tails means obviously i must have gotten all three heads one minus one eight seven eight so you can just simply count them in the uh, sample space here. Yeah. All right, the last thing in uh, section 4.1 is betting odds. Betting odds are usually stated against something happening. And this is the formula. Make sure you have this down in your notes. The odds against something happening is the probability that the event does not happen over the probability that the event does happen. It's the not over the probability that it does. This is a little formula. It's going to happen, you're going to get a fraction. Here's an example here. You bet that you can roll the number that you pick in advance when rolling a single die. So you pick a number between one and six, then roll the die. If your number comes up, you win, otherwise you lose. Well, the probability of winning is one chance in six. There's six different numbers, you're picking one. You have a one in six chance of winning. Well, if there's one number, there's only one number that's your number, there must be five numbers that are not your number. 
So the probability of not winning is five chances out of six. You have a one chance in six of winning because there's only one number that you're going to pick out of a total of six. And then there's five numbers on the, on the die that aren't your number. So you have five ways of getting a wrong number. So the find of odds against winning is probability of not winning, which is five, six divided by the probability that you do win one, six. Now, what invariably happens if you remember any little, if you remember your division, you're dividing here, you multiply by the inverse of the, I'm sorry, the reciprocal of one, six, but shot, the long and the short of it is the denominators cancel out, leaving you a, a ratio of five to one. And five to one can be written as five colon one, all right? So what that means is that for a fair payoff, you, you get back $5 for every dollar you bet. If you bet $5, you get back five times that, 25 bucks. And if you bet 10 bucks, you get back five times as much. What I would suggest here in doing these problems, figure out the probability of winning and then you'll know what the probability of not winning is. And the denominators here will always cancel out. In this case here, the uh, odds against are five to one. Make sure you have, some, it's not a very hard formula, but make sure you have it down in your notes. It's the probability of something not happening over the probability of something that does happen. If you know what this is, you know what that is by subtracting this from one or vice versa. If you know what the probability of not winning is, subtract that from one, you'll find a probability of winning. The denominators will always be the same and they'll cancel out. All right, let me stop sharing this. I'm still recording, which is great. And let me share my screen here. All right, so these are the, uh, this is the worksheet from section four one. Let me put this up a little bit. You know, in doing these, in fact, let me, let me do this a second here. Let me stop sharing this. And what I want to do is I want to stop my video. And I want to go back to sharing the screen. Okay, you folks all seeing that? Yeah. Yeah, okay, great. Get that out of the way. All right, you know, I, I've been saying this, you know, people who score the best, and a lot of times it's not the smartest person in the class. That scores the best. It's the person who has the best test taking ability. You know, you got a 50 50 chance of, choose, uh, of choosing the correct answer. Express that as a probability. Please, I just got done telling you probabilities range between zero and one. So please don't be silly and answer 50. Probability of something happening can't be 50, it's got to be between zero and one. A 50-50 chance is not going to be 0.9. It's not going to be 0.25. It's 0.50. It's one chance in two, 0 0.50. You know, you don't want to make, you don't want to give points away. Probabilities lie between zero and one. You know, there's always an answer in there that, you know, just doesn't make any sense. What's the probability of, a, of calculating the exact value of pi? Well, pi is an irrational number. There's been supercomputers that try to figure out pi to zillions, millions and millions of players. Basis. Guess what? 3.1456, whatever. It does, never terminates, nor does it ever end. There is no exact value. Your probability of calculating, excuse me, the exact value is zero. It can't happen. It's impossible. It's an irrational number. Probability it turns dark tonight. It's one. Here again, please don't tell me you're in Greenland because you're not. All right. It's a sure thing. It's going to turn dark tonight. In fact, as I look outside, it's getting dark already. Number four, which of the following cannot be probabilities? All right, it can't be negative one. Zero, yeah, can't, if something can't happen, it's zero. It could be one half, like, you know, tossing a coin, or it could be one turning dark and a sure thing. It can't be a negative number, letter A. What's the probability of an event that is certain to occur? Certain to occur, it's one. It's a sure thing, one. Number six, you have multiple choice question. You have four possible answers. What's the probability? probability of answering the correction the question correctly well there's only one correct answer 
All right. So number of favorable outcomes is one. How many answers do you, how many total answers do you have? That's a total four. You have a one in four chance. If you had seven questions, if you had, no, sorry, if you had a multiple choice that had, let's say seven possible answers, your probability of getting it correct would be, if you're guessing is one chance in seven. Favorable over total. With four questions, it's a one chance in four. If it was five questions, it'd be one in five or one in six. If you had only three questions, it'd be one in three. If you had two questions, one chance in two. Sample space consists of 174 equally likely outcomes. What's the probability of each? Well, one over 174. Each one has a one over 174 chance of um, being selected. Number eight, a die has six sides. Yeah, we know that. What's the probability of rolling a number less than five? Well, the question is how many favorable outcomes are there? How many numbers are there less than five? Well, the one is, the two is, the three is, and the four is. So the, prob the probability would be favorable. There are four numbers less than five. You have a total of six numbers. You have a four in six chance of rolling a number less than five. And of course they take four over six and they reduce it down to Lowest terms, two thirds. We've talked about this when I actually illustrated this the other night, uh, last Wednesday night, the sheet that you have when you roll two die, it lists all the 36 different outcomes. Here he's looking for the probability that some of the two numbers will be four. Well, there's three ways of getting a four with two die, a one and a three, a two and a two, or a three and a one. All right, so favorable would be three. You have a total of 36 off of that chart that I gave you with the um, the four suits of a deck of cards. So favorable is three, total is 36, 336, 336, the lowest terms is 112. Favorable, three outcomes are favorable out of a total of 36 equally likely things. As is the case in a lot of these problems, they give you all the information, but they don't give you everything. I think of that one we had back in, I forget what it was, section 2122 and 23, where they asked you for relative frequency, but you had to add up the frequencies, all right? That's the part that they didn't tell you. Well, here again, favorable over total, but he doesn't tell me the total here. He does tell me we have 66 women and 98 men. Duh, the total must be 66 plus 98. I got 164 people. What's the probability that I select a woman? Well, favorable, how many women are there? There are 66 women out of a total of 164. But you know, I had to figure that out. I had to actually add 66 with 98. How hard was that? 66 favorable, they were a woman out of a total of 164. Once again, reduced the lowest terms, 33 out of 82. If he'd asked me for the probability of men, it'd be 98 over 164. And whatever that is, reduced the lowest terms. Here's some money's uh, income levels of people at a country club. I find a probability that if I select somebody at random, they make at least 97,000. So out of these two, four, six, out of these 20 people, I underline the yearly salaries that were at least 97,000. There were 14 of them. So favorable, meaning that that person made at least 97,000 was 14 out of a total of 20. 14 out of 20 as a decimal. Oh, first of all, 14 out of 20 as a Reduced fraction is seven over 10, and as a decimal, it's 0.7. 1420 is your calculator, we told you 0.7. You got all these people that go to these three schools. What's the probability that the teacher calls on a calls a student, asks, calls upon a student to answer a question? The student will be a boy. Well, it's favorable over total. Now, which one you find first is it's up to you. Total nine plus three plus six plus seven yeah. plus three plus nine. I got a total of 37 students, all right? Favorable, how many of these students were boys? There was nine here and then seven there and three there for a total of 19, 19 out of 37. If you asked me for a girl, it would have been 18 out of 37. Favorable over total. Good, 1,982 people who walked into a blood bank, 344, 340 of those people had high blood pressure. What's the probability that the next person that comes in has high blood pressure? Relative frequency. Frequency is 340 out of a total of 182. 340 out of 182, your calculator would change this into a decimal very nicely for you. Not a big deal. 
you know, many of these problems, some of the answers don't even make sense right from the beginning. You're flipping a coin twice, all right? So you have um, two outcomes for the first flip and two outcomes for the second flip. Two times two is four. My sample space consists of four items. Letter C only has two items. Letter D has three. Now, why was it A and B both have four? Why was it A? Because letter B had heads, tails twice. You roll it twice. You could get a heads and a heads, a heads and a tail, or maybe a tail and a heads. And the last one is a tail and a tail. The key thing is that the sample space consists of four items, two times two. If I roll a coin four times, my sample space would be two times two is four times two is eight times two again would be 16, all right? Um, doing it three times, two times, two times, two. Well, that's eight. There's eight outcomes. Let us C only has six outcomes, so it can't be C. Um, letter A only has two, four, six, only has seven. So right off the top, I knew going in two times, two times, two, because I'm, I'm flipping it going three times. My sample space consists of eight different outcomes. So I know it was either going to be A, I'm sorry, it was either going to be a letter B or letter D. Why wasn't it B? Well, I need my glasses here because B had heads, tails, tails twice. So correct answer is letter D. Odds against, once again, the odds against is the probability that something does not happen over the probability that it does happen. You get a multiple choice question with six possible answers. The probability of getting it right is one chance in six. I call that probability of winning, one chance in six. Well, if there's one answer that's correct, there must be five answers that are wrong. Probably get it wrong is five chances out of six. And once again, the denominator is the sixes. When I do the division and I multiply by the reciprocal here, the sixes cancel out, leaving me five to one. In a certain town, 25% of the people commute by bike. If a person is selected at random, what's the odds against selecting someone who commutes by bike? Well, 25% is one fourth. So there's a one, four, one in four chance that I get somebody to compute, that commutes by bike. Then it must be a three in four chance that I get somebody who doesn't. All right, so the probability, the odds again, excuse me, is the probability that something does not happen. Well, not picking somebody who goes, who commutes to work by bike is three chances in four. Probability that I do get somebody, the 25% is one chance in four. And once again, the fours, the denominators will always cancel out leaving you a ratio of three to one. All right, you've got to set up the little formula. It's not a big formula, it's not, it's not hard at all, but this is how you do it. You can't make up your own way of doing a problem unless you, I don't know, you want to get it wrong, so. That is that, I'm still recording. And how are we doing a half an hour? Not bad, not bad, not bad. Yeah, okay. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to go down that road. It's not worth the effort here. Give me a second. I need to close a couple of things up here. Don't mind me, I'm just talking. Okay, you should be seeing section four two. Yes, no, help me out. Somebody? Yes. Yes. Okay, so the first section four one is pretty straightforward. Three ways of finding probability. Intuition, which I can't test you on. Relative frequency, and then equally likely events. Favorable outcomes divided by the total number of outcomes. All right, great. Now we move into what's called compound events, multiple things happening, all right? And we have what's called the uh, multiplication rule, which we start out with and then followed by the addition rule. And both of these use the words and, multiplication rule uses the word and, and the addition rule uses the word or. Many times the word and is just implied. It's, it doesn't tell you this and this, it's implied that it's an and situation. 
whenever we have an or situation, the word or in a single trial, either this happened or something else happened, that word or will always be there. So you'll know when to use the addition rule as opposed to using the, um, the multiplication rule. The notation, hey, what's the probability that A happens first and B happens second? In multiple trials, of a, event A occurs first and event B occurs second. And then we could have, you know, something happening third and fourth. The idea is that we're going to use the multiplication rule. All right, here's a problem here. Let me move this stuff out of the way. You roll two dice. What's the probability you get a five on each die? And then he says, okay, consider a collection of six balls identical in every way except for color. There are three green balls, two blue balls, one red ball. You draw two balls at random from the collection without replacing them or without replacing the first ball before you draw the second. What's the probability that both balls will be green? Now he says this, he says, it seems that these proof problems are nearly alike. Yeah, they are alike in the sense that in each case, in each case you're finding the probability of two events occurring together. In the first problem, you're asked to find the probability of rolling a die twice, getting a five on the first die and a five on the second. In the second problem, you want the probability of drawing a green ball on the first draw and a green ball on the second draw. The two problems differ in one important aspect, however. In the dice problem, the outcome of a five on the first die has no effect on the probability of getting a five on the second die. You roll a die, you get a five. It's not like the die can talk to the second die and says, hey, I came out of five. No, one has nothing to do with another. These events are called independent. The outcome of the first had no effect. The outcome of me getting a five on the first die had no effect on me getting a five on the second die. These events are called independent. Notice the definition here. Two events are independent if the occurrence or non-occurrence of one does not change the probability that the other event will occur will occur. Now, as far as the problem, these, the problem dealing with the colored balls, the probability that the first ball is green is three chances out of six. Why? There are three green balls and there's a total of six. All right, since there are six balls and three of them are green. If you get a green on the first draw, the probability of getting a green on the second draw is changed to two out of five. Why? Because you pulled one green ball out, you put it off to the side. Well, guess what? Out of the remaining five balls, only two of them are five. If I'm sorry, only two of them are green. If I did it again, I took that second green ball out. Guess what? There's only a total of four balls left and only one of them is green. These events are not dependent. They're dependent. All right. When the outcome of something affects the outcome of the second thing happening, we call these guys dependent. The two events, why does, the, why does independence and dependence matter? Well, the type of events determines the way we compute the probabilities, independent and dependent, all right? You gotta be aware of this. This is where it gets a little bit, you know, a little dicey. Two events are dependent if the occurrence of one of them affects the probability of the occurrence of the other. Doesn't mean that it causes it, it just affects, it changes the probability of the second and then the third and the fourth and all the way down the line, depending on how many uh, trials you're doing. Dependent events. The basic multiplication rule is used to find the probability of A happening first and B happening second. The probability of it occurs, A occurs in the first trial and the event B occurs in the second. If the outcome of the first event somehow affects the probability of the second event, it's important to adjust the probability of the second event like we did with the green balls. We had one less green ball and then we had one less total. We had to subtract one from the numerator and the, the denominator. All right, an example of uh, here again, independent events. Say, hey, what's the probability I roll a die twice and I get a five on each die? Well, the probability of me rolling a die the first time and getting a five is one chance in six. The probability of me rolling the die again and getting a, a five is on chance in six. The fact that I got a five on the first roll had no effect on me getting a five on the second roll. In fact, it would not have, have no effect if I did it a third time or a fourth time. These are independent events. Rolling a die, the outcome on the first has no effect on what you get on the second. 
It's not that I can talk to one another. Oh, I came out of five. Don't come out of five again. No, that's that ridiculous. Independent events. Now, this is the one with the uh, the colored balls. All right, there are uh, six balls. Three of them are green, two are blue, and one is red. What's the probability of getting a green on the first draw? Favorables, three green ones out of a total of six. You assume you drew a green ball out. You put it off to the side somewhere. Well, guess what? You go back, probably of getting another green one. Well, guess what? Favorable, there's only two of them, two green ones left. And total, there's only five total. If I did it again, it'd be a one chance in four. Well, I couldn't get four green uh, marbles because or balls because there's only three of them to begin with, all right? So three, six times two fifths, six over 30 as a decimal point two. Dependent, as opposed to the previous one, which were independent events. So you gotta be thinking here. You got to be thinking. This is super, super important. Obviously, it's easier to calculate independent events because the probabilities don't change. Probably a rolling a five, one out of six, second roll, one out of six, third roll, one out of six. Well, here's the case. Whenever I'm given a problem, all right, and he gives me, doesn't give me totals or counts, he gives me percentages. All right, whenever he gives the problem, gives me percentages. In this case here, uh, manufacturing process has a 70% yield, meaning 70% of the products are acceptable, 30% are defective. Notice he's not telling me I've got 100 defective or I've got uh, 22 that are not. He's giving me percentages. Theoretically, this these problems are dependent events. If I take one out, I got one less to choose from. But because he's giving me percentages, I treat these problems as being independent. I kind of like that because the probabilities don't change. I'm drawing three, if three products are selected, the probability of me getting a, an acceptable one is 0 0.7, 0 0.70 times, guess what? It's the same probability for me doing it again, 0 0.70 times the third one, 0 0.70. I like these because even though theoretically these are dependent events, because I'm not giving a raw account, I'm giving a percentages, I think of them as being independent, which means I can use the same probability over and over again, which makes my life that much easier. Many times with these problems, you're giving, you're giving shots, but what has to happen here is they don't give you the total. Sometimes they do, but you need to know totals because hey, probability with equally likely events, is favorable over total. Well, guess what? You got to know the totals. Here we got an, uh, results from a lie detector test. How many people had positive results? Well, you had these 15 here who had false positives. These 42 had false, I'm sorry, true positives for a total of 57. Uh, working down, these people did not lie, all right? All right, 15 here and 32 here for a total of 47. Uh, these people did lie, 42 here and nine for a total of 51. The important thing is, is getting the total number of people because probability is figured out by favorable over a total. So if you have a chart and the total's not there, make sure you do them. So like he's asking us here, what's the probability that the first subject had a positive test result and the second one had a negative? Well, there are 57 people who had a positive result. Here they are. These 15 and 42, 57 out of a total of 98 had a positive result. Times, how many people had a um, negative result? Well, negative results here, these people, these 32 and those nine, 41 people. But guess what? 41, the total is not 98 because you already took out this one person with a positive result. All right, so it's 41 out of 97. All right, these are dependent events. You had 57 who had a positive result out of 98. You had 41 who had a negative result, but not out of 98, because you picked this one person, this positive person, you already took them out of the mix. You only had a total of 97. All right, and multiplying this out, 57 over 98 times 41 over 97. Your calculator would give you a result of 0.246 dependent events.
sometimes you subtract one from the numerator and denominator and lot sometimes it's just one from the denominator you got a situation here where you got say a wheeling tire company produced a batch of 5000 tires 200 were defective well you got to think you got 5000 tires 200 were defective the remaining 4800 had no defects he gives you the information, but a lot of times you still got to figure out what's going on. He's telling me, he's telling me I have 200 defective. Guaranteed, he's going to ask me about things that are not defective. Well, 5,000 subtracted 200 that are defective, leaving me 4,800 that were not defective. You got to have, you know, it's more than common sense, I think. You got to have a feel for these problems and don't fall for things. You got to be thinking. You got to think. It's just not, you know, just put numbers in. You've got to think this through. So you asked me two questions here. If, if I pick four ties at random, what's the probability that they all were good? Well, if 200 were defective, then I got 40, 100 that are good. And then he turned around and he asked me the same question, but now he wants me to pick 100 ties. Well, let's see how these problems differ. To answer letter B, it'd be a real pain, all right? So there's something called the 5% guideline. If calculations become very cumbersome, and if the sum of the sample size is not more than 5%, he says, even though these guys are dependent, treat them as independent. It's the same thing with the percentages. And I kind of like that. He says, hey, if the calculation becomes too cumbersome, Treat them as being, you know, independent, which means you can use the same probability over and over again. Well, let's think about picking the four ties. We want a good one and a good one and a good one and a good one and a good one. All right. So if there are 5,000 ties, 200 were defective. The remaining 4,800 out of 5,000. First time I pick is I get a 4,800 over 5,000. Good. I pull that one tire out. Guess what? I've only got 4,799 out of a total of 4,999 that are good. Put that one up to the side. Now I've only got one less. I got 4,798 out of 4,998. And the fourth one is I'm subtracting one again because I already pulled these three tires out. 4,797 out of 4,997. It's tough even to say that, even let alone do it. This is not considered cumbersome. You know, it's four fractions. I'm using parentheses here. You would not have to because your calculator knows um, art of operations. Now, look at the one with 100 ties. Do you think I want to do this, subtract one from the numerator and denominator and do it 100 times? No, I'd be there forever. So what he says is that this that would be a very cumbersome calculation. Plus the fact that my sample, my N is 100, 100 ties, uh, I'm picking 100 ties, 100 over 5,000, it's only 2%. It's less than this magic 5%. The key thing is, is that to do it, you know, do this, keep subtracting one from the numerator and denominator 100 times, would take me forever. So even though theoretically these guys are dependent because I got one less tie and one less total over and over again, I'm going to use the same percentage. 48 out of 5,000, four, I'm sorry, 4,800 were um, good tires. I'm sorry, def, good tires out of a total of 5,000. Well, 4,800 out of 5,000 as a decimal is 0. 0.96. The probability of me getting a good tire is 0. 0.96. This, this, this fraction here, 48 out of 5,000 expressed as a decimal is 0. 0.96. But because the calculations were cumbersome, I can treat these guys as being independent, which means use that, use that 0 0.9, where am I? Yeah, I lost it. Use that, use that 0 0.96 a hundred times. Well, 0 0.96 times itself a hundred times is like you raising it to the hundredth power. All right, on your calculator, there's a little thing that's called a carrot, put in 0 0.96, you raise it to the hundredth power 0 0.0169 so there's an example of where you have something that's very cumbersome um i'm not sure you'll see one like that but you definitely will see one where i give you percentages and when you're given percentages even though theoretically the example is one of dependency treated as independency which is great because you get to use the same 
decimal, the same fraction over and over again, depending on how many times you're, using, you're doing the trial. All right, so I'm gonna stop there because that's the multiplication rule. I'm gonna end that show. I want to stop sharing and give me a second here. Give me a second. How does proper me to do is to pull these up because I don't want to open them up all at once. Do not want to open them up all at once. How am I doing on time? Doing real good on time, Mr. Gomb. Doing real all right, so this is the, well, you don't see it because I haven't shared it. All right, I'm still recording. That's great. Still recording. Fantastic. Here again, I've already said this. I've shown you where. I've shown you where um, these answers are all located. Um, it's not in this section, it's in the previous, it says three and four. Anyways, I actually even emailed you these. Make sure you have, the test cons consists of one, 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 two, two, one, two, 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 three, three, one, three, two, three, three, four, one, and four, two. Four, three is not included. Make certain you have all of these worksheets with the answers. Now, I say answers. I'm not talking about just having the ABC. These here where I actually have the screenshots. Now, I showed you where those were. I've got them. I, they're called answers for chapters one, two, and three. And then it's called answers for chapter four. They're in the modules. I'm not going to go there because you've been in it since well, two and a half weeks now. Anyways, here we go. Is event de B dependent on event A? Events are dependent if the occurrence of the first event somehow affects the occurrence of the second. A mosquito lands on your arm, you get, you get a mosquito bite. Does the fact that the mosquito have any effect, landing on your arm have any effect that the mosquito bit you? Yeah, I guess so since he's on your arm or she's on your arm, these are dependent events. The outcome of the first had an effect on the outcome of the second. A green ball is drawn from a box with five balls and placed next to the box. A red ball is drawn and placed next. Did the outcome of the first somehow affect the probability of the second? Well, yeah, you drew a green ball out. Then when it comes time to draw the red ball, you haven't got five balls. You've already taken the green one out. You have only four balls, yes, left. Yes, dependent events. The occurrence of the first thing, drawing out the green ball, had an effect on the probability of getting a red ball because there was one less total. I mean, it went from five down to four. If you did it again, it'd be only three balls. A man visits New York on vacation. He visits Central Park. Does the fact that he's in New York somehow affect the probability that he vis visit he visits Central Park? Doesn't mean it caused it, but the fact that he's in New York, yeah, he obviously increases the odds that he visits Central Park as opposed to him visiting San Francisco. Doesn't mean it caused it, but it has an effect on the probability and made it a lot greater because he's in New York already. You cook a chicken improperly, you get seminola, seminola poisoning. Did, he, did the outcome of the first somehow affect the outcome of the second? Yeah, cooking it improperly probably had a lot to do with you getting seminola poisoning, dependent events. All right, pardon me for laughing. Nothing funny about seminola, I guess. As I start to read the problem, I go, oh, great, percentages percentages he's not giving me totals so i can treat these events as being independent which means the probabilities don't change it's like rolling a die two times you have a one in six chance of rolling a two. Second time you roll you have a one in six chance of rolling a two. Third time you roll you have a one in six chance in i'm sorry independent events because he's giving me percentages all right, even though theoretically these would be dependent events because I'm pulling a Democrat out of the list, because of the percentages, I can treat this 
as being independent, which means I can use the same percentage, 0.39, 39%. So probably I'll be drawing or picking a Democrat, 0.39, and which means I'm multiplying, and the probability of picking another Democrat would be 0.39. And if I did it a third time, it would be times 0.39, all right? Notice he's saying here, find a probability that they're both Democrats. He doesn't say the first person is a Democrat and the second person, but it's implied. The word and is implied. If it were an or situation, which we'll see in a minute, he would have to give me the word or. And is implied. Probably of picking a Democrat first, 0.39 times. Probably of picking a Democrat second, 0.39. If I were doing it more and more, it'd be the same probability. I'd like that. I don't have to worry about taking one from the numerator and denominator. I can use this, the same uh, probability over and over again. Same thing in number six. He doesn't give me a raw count. He's giving me percentages. Hey, the probability of um, this uh, manufacturing process, 70% of the products are acceptable, 30% are defective. If I pick three products, find a probability that the first and the second and the third were all acceptable. Well, it's 0 0.70 for the first times 0, 0.0 for the second times 0, 0.0 for the third. I like that. 0 0.70 to raise to the third power, 0.343. Don't need any parentheses. This one is a little different. With replacement means you pick something out, you put that thing right back in. It's like starting all over again. Well, if I'm starting all over again, these events are independent. It's like doing the same thing over and over and over again with the replacement. Most of these problems, if they don't, if, if the problem deals with replacement, I would have to tell you. If I don't say anything, you can't assume replacement, all right? Don't assume replacement. If it is with replacement, I will tell you and I'll bold it out. In fact, I'm not even sure I have a problem with replacement. Anyways, you have 98 uh, light bulbs. Sorry, 78 light bulbs, nine are defective. You know what he hasn't told me? How many are good ones? If I've got 78 and nine are bad, the remaining 69 must be good. No, he doesn't tell me that. He thinks I'm bright enough to figure that out on my own. He's playing a little game with me. If three light bulbs are randomly selected from the bin with replacement, find a probability that they're all good ones. Well, first time out, favorable over total. If nine are defective, 69 out of 78 were good. I pick a good one out, I put it back in. Guess what? It's the same thing. Probably me getting a good one again is 69 out of 78. I take it out, I put it back in with placement. Guess what? The probability of me getting another good one is the same probability, 69 out of 78. Now here, I multiplied them all out. Here, I actually raised this to the third power on my calculator. And if you don't know how to do that, just YouTube it. If I have time, I'll show you at the very end. It's a, I call it the carry key. 69 out of 78 raised to the third power, 0. 0.692. Here again, one with percentages. I like that. 79% of adults have health insurance. What's the probability if I pick four adults, they all have health insurance? Well, it's 0. 0.79. For the first, probably the second 0. 0.79 times the third 0. 0.79 times the fourth 0.79. You see what a hassle would have been if you had told me, you know, I got 50 people and 16 had health insurance. I'd have to be subtracting one from the numerator and denominator. It'd become a hassle. I like when it gives me percentages. It makes my problem real easy. Even though theoretically this problem is one of dependency, I treat it as being independent, which means I can use that same probability 0.79 in this case four times. All right, this is kind of a weird one. You may have gotten this one wrong. It won't be on the exam. It just had you think a little bit. You got three people and uh, find a probability that they all have the same birthday. Well, here's the key to this, all right? The very first person doesn't have to match up with anybody. The first person in line can have any birthday he or she wants. 365 out of 365. It's 365 days that person could be born or any one of those days. Let's assume that the date this person was born was July 1st. The second person has to have that same exact birthday, July 1st. Well, there's only one July 1st out of 365. The third person has to have that exact same birthday, July 1st. Well, there's only one out of 365, favorable over total. Well, one over 365 times itself twice is one over 365 squared. 
this is nothing more than the number one. One times this comes out to be this on your calculator. Now, when you see an E with a minus six, that means it's like saying 10 to the minus six, which tells me to move this decimal point here between the seven and the five, six places to the left. Well, one place puts it in front of the seven, then I would have to add five more zeros. That's what minus six means. If it was minus five, I would move the point five places to the left. Then, of course, if it's not negative, if it's positive, then I would move it to the right, obviously. But you normally see this with negatives, all right? Move decimal point as many places to the left. All right, you have two cards. Uh, you are dealt two cards successively without replacement. You didn't have to tell me this. If he didn't say anything about replacement, I wouldn't assume replacement. Here he's just, you know, he's just being extra careful. He says, hey, you're not, you're not replacing these. From a shuffle deck, what's the probability that both cards are black? Well, it's favorable over total. All right, these are equally likely events. Picking a card out of a deck, they're equally likely. Half the deck is black. 26 out of the 52 cards are black. You, you assume you pull a black card. You put it off to the side. Well, guess what? You go back to pull another black card. Favorable is, guess what? There's only 25 black cards out of a total of 51. If I were to draw again, it'd be only 24 black cards out of a total of 50. And then 23 out of 49, you get the idea. Now, I show you a little, um, I did this last time where you can take this decimal and change it to a uh, fraction. You do it with a math key. I showed this to you last uh, last Wednesday. Number 11 is kind of similar to number nine. You know, it's just kind of a head scratcher. Instead of these people having the same birthday, I'm saying, hey, what's the probability that four people have different birthdays? The little trick to this is the first person doesn't have to can have any birthday they wish. They don't have to match up with anybody. Let's say this person was born on July 1st again. The next person has to have a birthday different than July 1st. Well, guess what? There are 364 days out of the year that are not July 1st out of a total of 365. Let's assume this person was born on August the 1st. This next person can't have July 1st, nor can he have um, August 1st. Well, guess what? There are 363 days that aren't July 1st and August 1st out of a total of 365. The next person can't have July 1st or August 1st, or let's say this person was born in September 1st. This third, fourth person can't have either one of these three birthdays. Well, guess what? There are only 362 days left that aren't July 1st, August 1st, or September the 1st. So soon as a little head scratch. If you figure this out on your own, congratulations. The key to it is this very first person can have any birthday he or she wanted, but I don't test you on that. It was just a matter. It was my uh, problem to get you guys thinking. You got 49 women. Um, in a competition in 20 men. Duh, he hasn't given me the total. How hard is it for me to add 40 and 20? Folks, you're in college. He's not going to hold your hand through this. He's not going to say, oh, by the way, make sure you add 49 and 20 to get a total of 69. He kind of figures you know how to do that. I'm picking five winners. What's the probability that they're all men? Well, first time out there, 20 men out of a total of 69. I pull that man out of the crowd. Guess what? There's only 19 men left out of a total of 68 people. I pull him out. There's only 18 guys left out of a total of 69, favorable over total. Then it's only 17 guys out of 66 total. And finally, there's only 16 men left out of a total of 65. All right, dependent events. But he didn't tell me it was a total, but duh, how hard is it to figure out 20 and 49 total of 69? You can see where you got to do some thinking. It's, I mean, you know, I, I've heard this for, for years and years and years. You know, folks hate word problems. They hate word problems because they're never taught how to do a word problem. They never were taught how to read critically. They just want to see some numbers in front of them and add the numbers, multiply. I have no reason why they're doing it. You got to be able to think the problem through. If you can't do that, well, you got, you got some issues. All right, it is what it is. I really don't apologize for the course. It is what it is. I mean, some courses are tougher than others. And this is statistically, this is the toughest chapter to a certain extent. 
anyways, here's a table. Luckily, he's given me the total. How many men do I have? 442. I got some non-smokers, some light smokers, some heavy smokers. How many women? I got 506. Some are non-smokers, some are light, and some are heavy. And then we add down total of non-smokers, light smokers, heavy smokers, and then how many men do I have? How many women is my total? All right, what's the probability if I select two random? If I select two people at random out of the 948 total that they're both heavy smokers, well, first time out, there's 81 out of 948. I pull that person out of the group. Second time I go to pick a heavy smoker, I've only got 80 heavy smokers out of a total of 947. If I were to do it again, it'd be 79 out of 946. You get the idea. Here again, I've used for illustration purposes, I've used parentheses. You wouldn't have to the calculator knows out of operations. Table below, smoking habits of asthma sufferers. Um, I got here again, it's the same 378 men, 506 women, 884. Um, no, I'm sorry, it's a different shot. A different shot. It's a, they, give us, they give us the totals, anyways. That's the good thing. They give us the totals. Two different people are selected at random from 884 subjects. Find a probability that they're both women. Well, first time out, favorable over total. That's 506 women out of a total of 884 total. I pull that woman aside. Now I only have favorable. There's only 505 women left out of a total of 883. If I did it again, it'd be 504 over 882. You get the idea. Dependent events. Um, a sample of four calculators is randomly selected from a group to, uh, containing 46 that are defective and 26 with no defects. Once again, he's omitted how many we have for a total. D, 46 and 26. I can figure out that my total is 42. I want to pick four calculators that are defective. Well, I start out with 46 that are defective, favorable over total. I pull that one calculator, I put it off to the side. Guess what? Second time I go into the batch, only 45 are defective out of a total of 71. And then 44 out of 70, and then 43 out of a total of 69. If I were to do it again, it'd be 42 out of 68. But the key thing is, is that these are multiplication. These are and problems. The so probability of getting a defective one first and a defective one second and a defective one. Notice the word and is implied here. But be aware, when we get to the or situation, if it's an or problem, the word or will be there. It's in the single trial, the word or. The and is a lot of times implied. And that's pretty straightforward point. Uh, but you see how important it is to have this by your side because, as I said before, you know, <laughs> I'm not going to give you homework problems and then give you a test problem that doesn't resemble the homework. The homework is to prepare you for the test. So obviously the test problem is gonna be very similar. You know, it may not be um, defective equipment, it may be whoever, but the idea is either gonna be dependent or independent events. And if it's a percentage, you treat it as being independent. And if it's, if it's uh, very cumbersome, which I don't think you run across that, you would treat it as being independent, which I kind of like because the probabilities don't change. You're not worrying about subtracting one from the denominator or in many cases, subtracting one from the numerator and the denominator as well. All right, so what do I want to do now? I want to close this up now and go to my desktop and where am I? Oh yeah, I see where I want to. We just done, we just did the addition rule. No, we did the multiplication rule. Here we are right here, addition rule. All right, so if I find a probability of something happening first and something happening second, we're using the multiplication rule. What I tell students, if you have an and problem and you're adding, you're doing it wrong, the and goes with multiplication. The or goes with addition. The A's do not match up. If you have a probability of something happening first and something happening second and something happening third, you are multiplying the probabilities. We're going to see here that with the word or. 
This section presents the addition rule as a device for finding probabilities that can be expressed as A. What's the probability that A happens first, or I'm sorry, that A happens or B happens in a single draw, a single outcome? Either one thing happens or something else happens. Keyword obviously is the word or, the inclusive or, which means either one or the other or both. Addition rule. When finding the probability that event A occurs or event B occurs, find the total number of ways that A can occur and the total number of ways that B can occur. But here's the key. Just like with the multiplication rule, we had to think about, hey, are these events dependent or independent? Do I have to adjust the probability of the second thing to take into account what happened first? With the or problems, you have to count the ways that these things can happen, but you don't want to count anything more than once. You don't want to, what they call double count. And I'll show you what that means in a second. Here's the formal rule. If you're expressed, if you're given a problem, hey, what's the probability of A happening or B happening? Take the probability that A happens, you add it with the probability that B happens, and Excuse you me. subtract. Excuse me. Are you sharing anything? Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. I'm glad someone spoke up. I depend on you folks. Apparently the other 15 people were, I don't know what they were doing. Who was that? Who did that for me? I did. Who's I? I can't see who I is. Okay, yeah, this is me. <laughs> All right, well, we'll move on. Here, once again, we're presenting now with the um, I'm going to find my slide. Give me a second. Is everybody else is sleeping? Addition rule. All right, we use it with the word or. Oh, you hear me? You hear me talk through this. When we find the probabilities, all right, of an or situation, we add the ways that A can happen with the ways that B can happen, but we don't want to double count, all right? Here's the formal addition rule. Probably of A happening first, or I'm sorry, probably of A or B happening. You take the probability of A, you add a probability of B, and you subtract any double count, all right? Probably of both denotes the probability that A and B occur at the same time, and I'll show you in a minute what that means. We say that events A and B are mutually exclusive or disjoint. I like the word disjoint because we think I think of Venn diagrams. They're disjoint if they cannot occur together. This means that A and B have no outcomes in common. So sometimes we have mutually exclusive events or disjoint events. We don't have to worry about any double counting because these things cannot happen at the same time. But many times we do have to worry about it. We don't want to double count anything. Here's a classic example. Here's a class, a stats class with 31 students. You've got some freshmen. All right, you got 15 freshmen. Um, you got uh, five, you got nine of them are girls and six boys. Out of the eight sophomores, you got three females and five uh, males. Juniors, you got four females, two males. And seniors, you got one female and one male. All right. Suppose we select one student at random from the class, one student, one trial, find a probability that the student is either a freshman or a sophomore, all right? Since there are 15 freshmen out of 31 students, the probability of picking a freshman is favorable over total 15 out of 31. Since there are eight sophomores out of the 31 students, there are, there's an eight out of 31 chance of picking a sophomore. Now notice, I'm not doing multiple trials. It's either one or the other in a single trial. So there's no subtraction from the numerator or denominator. Now, here's the case. A student cannot be a freshman and a sophomore at the same time. So I'm not worried about any double count. These guys are mutually exclusive. They cannot happen at the same time. I can't pick a sophomore or a freshman. So I take the probability of a freshman I add it with a probability of a sophomore. Notice there was no subtraction necessary because this was in a single trial. And the word or, it means that I'm adding the probabilities. All right, 23 out of 31 as a decimal point, uh, 742. Now, 
Notice that we can simply add the probability of a freshman to the probability of a sophomore to find a probability that a student selected at a random will either be a freshman or a sophomore. No student can be a freshman and a sophomore at the same time. All right, second problem, letter B says, now same thing, select one student at random, what's the probability that the student is either a male or a sophomore? Well, how many sophomores do you have? Eight out of a total of 31. How many males do you have? 14 out of 31. But the deal is, if I go back here, there are five, five of your sophomores are males. So I've already counted these. When I counted the males up, I counted these guys. Now, when I go to count them as, um, as sophomores, I don't want to double count. I've already counted them once as males. I don't want to double count them as sophomores all right get back to it yeah probability of a sophomore was eight out of 31 probably me selecting a male was 14 out of 31 but there were five sophomores who were males i don't want to double count i've already counted those, those guys here as sophomores i don't want to double count them as uh, as males so what i'm doing here I'm taking the probability of sophomores, I'm adding the probability of male, and I'm subtracting the sophomores who were males. All right, so here's my subtraction. Another way of doing this is when you're counting up these males, just don't count the ones you've already counted up already. Don't count them from Jump Street or count them and then subtract what I call the double count. 17 out of 31.548. This is this thing again about this probably of one success, and I'll get to that in a second. I'll get to that. It's just, I don't know, here it is right over here. Here's the deal. When you're asked to find the probability of at least one success, the only way you can calculate it is by using the complement rule. You take one and you subtract the probability of no success. And you're saying, well, why do I have to do that? Recall the problem where I had the four students and I said, hey, what's the probability of at least one attending Brockton schools? Well, the idea of selecting one student that goes to Brockton, is it the first student, the second student, the third, the fourth, or the fifth? You don't know. What gets even crazier, let's say, what's the probability of getting two people that go to Brockton schools? Is it the first and the second kid, or the first and the third, or the first and the fifth, the fourth and the fifth? At this stage of the game, we do not know how to do that. So the only way we can do it, at least one problem, is to follow this rule here. The probability of at least one success, you're gonna take the whole number one, subtract the probability that you've got no successes. That's the only, only way that you can handle this. All right. And here's a problem here. He kind of lays it out. Yeah, you know, let A B denote the probability of getting at least one. The complement of A is the event of getting none of the items being considered. Calculate the probability of none and then subtract that from the whole number one. You're using what's called the complement rule. And this is the example here. If I'm asked to find a probability of at least one tail, I take one and I, pro I subtract the probability of no tails. But what does it mean to get no tails? It means that all the flips must have been heads. So this is kind of a really basic example. Uh, you've got what going on here? You got defective tires. Assume the probability of a defective tire is 0. 0.0003. If a retail outlet buys 100 tires, find the probability they get at least one defective. All right, the probability of getting one defective is one minus the probability of not getting any defective. Well, what's me? What do I mean by not getting any defective? Well not getting any defective must have been all 100 must have been good tires if he tells me the probability of getting a bad tire is 0. 0.0003 if i take one and subtract that from if i take one subtract 0. 0.0003 i get 0. 99997 that's the probability of getting a good tire but i'm picking it a hundred times so raising that to the hundredth power is this, but now you gotta remember, you gotta subtract that from the whole number one. The probability of getting at least one is one minus the probability of none. If none of them are defective, they all must have been good tires. All right, probability of getting a defective one is this, probability of getting a good tire. You're using this a hundred times. This one was good, the second one was good, the third one is good, 
all the way out to the hundredth one is good. But here's how they're going to trick you. You're going to do all that. You're going to get this answer. That's going to be one of the answers on the answer sheet. But you got to remember that you have to take that and subtract it from one. You're using the complement rule. All right. So let's see how this plays out. And I'm getting pretty adept at this. You all should be seeing my screen now. Hello. Just one person, just tell me yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. Are the events disjoint? Disjoint means they cannot happen at the same time. You draw one ball colored red from a bag, you draw one ball and it's colored blue. Well, the ball is either going to be red or it's going to be blue. It can't be red and blue at the same time. Please don't tell me, well, it's a half red ball, it's a half blue ball. No, you either draw a red one out or you draw a blue one out. These, uh, these events are disjoint. You can't draw a red one and a blue one at the same time. It's either going to be red or it's going to be blue. A man, is, a man uh, you meet a man with an umbrella, you meet a man with a raincoat. Are these disjoint? Well, disjoint means they cannot happen at the same time. Well, chances are, if it's raining out, the man's got an umbrella and he's wearing a raincoat. It could very well happen at the same time. No, these guys are not disjoint. They could happen at the same time. You read a book by uh, Mark Twain, you read a book about Tom Sawyer. Well, guess what? Mark Twain wrote The Adventures of Tom Sawyer. These guys are not disjoint. They can happen at the same time. In fact, they did. He wrote The Adventures of Tom Sawyer. You get invited to a formal um, uh, dinner affair and you're wearing blue jeans. Well, Hopefully that cannot happen at the same time. You're going to a formal dinner affair, you know, for a woman, you're wearing a dress and for a man, you're wearing a suit or a tux, right? Yes, these are disjoint. You won't find people with blue jeans, blue jeans at a formal dinner affair. At least I don't think you should or would. You know, it's kind of, um, people wear jeans to all kinds of things, but a formal affair, you think you'd have enough juillas to uh, put a suit on for your man. Probably if something happened is one seventh, what's the probability of the complement? Well, one minus one seventh, one minus one seventh is six sevenths. And I changed that to a fraction. I went to my math key. The very first option was fraction. I pressed that, I pressed it enter again. It took 0 0.8571 and changed it into a fraction for me. I showed you how to do that last Wednesday. Based on meteorological records, the probability that it will snow in a certain town in January 1st is 0.185. What's the probability it will not snow? Well, the complement of the complement of 0.185 is 1 minus 0.185 or 0.815. 1 minus the complement, take 1 minus the probability of it, the thing that happened. This is one people fall for. All right. Hey, what's the probability that you pick a person at random and the birthday was not in May? Your first thought is that 12 months in a year and birth, someone's birthday not being in May, you're saying, well, May is one month in a the year. There are 11 months left. So it's 11 over 12. Let us see. You're wrong. The reason that you're wrong is days in the months are not equally likely. Not all the months have the same amount of days. All right, I talked about this in my voiceover. 30 days has September, April, June, and November. All the rest have 31 except for February 28. So what you got to do is take the year, break it down into days. There are 365 days in the year. How many days are there in May? There are 31. So there are 334 days in the year that are not days in May. You got to break it down to days, not months, because months are not equally likely. The amount of days in each month is not the same. That's kind of one of those, I got your problems. All right, 334 over 365. If you got that one wrong, you know what it is. But I explained it in the voiceover. Here, I got a spin out with numbers 1 through 21. So I actually listed those numbers out. What's the probability that the spinner will stop on an even number or a multiple of 3? Well, the minute I see it, it's an or problem. I know I'm adding. And I'll put these in order. 
The multiplication ones, the and problems will come in one group and the or problems will come after that. I don't mix them up to try and make it hard for you. All right, how many even numbers do you have? Two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, and 20. You have 10 out of the 21 days that are, I'm sorry, 10 out of the 21 numbers that are even. How many numbers are multiples of three? Three, the six, the nine, the 12, the 15, the 18, and the 21. You have seven out of those 21 that are multiples of three. But now there's a double count. Six was an even number and it was a multiple of three. 12 was an even number and a multiple of three. 18 was an even number and a multiple of three. I don't want to double count. I've already counted them once as even. I don't want to count them again as multiples of three. So I took the, the even numbers, probably of an even. I added the probability of a multiple of three and I subtracted the double count, the numbers that were both even and multiples of three. That left me 14 over 21. And to lowest terms, that's two thirds. But here's a case, there's no way, if this were on a test, which it won't be this particular problem, but there'd be no way I could figure this out in my head. I would actually have to do exactly what I did here is to write all these numbers out. And then, you know, hey, how, many even numbers do I have? how many odd numbers? I'm sorry, how many even numbers do I have? How many numbers are multiples of three? And then how many are both even and multiples of three? Here again, these shots. A lot of times you're given these shots. And here's a great one because it gives me the totals going down horizontally. It gives vertically and it gives me the totals going horizontally. It tells me I got 1,127 people. Find a probability that the person is a man or a heavy smoker. Well, it's an or problem. I know I'm adding. What's the probability of picking a man? Well, there's 583 of, out of 1,127 people are men. What's the probability of me picking a heavy smoker? Well, it's 34 here and 35 to the total of 69 out of the 100, uh, 1127 that are heavy smokers. But notice, these are my men here, my 583. These are my heavy smokers, the 69. But these 34 men, I counted them as men, and I'm about to count them again as heavy smokers. Can't do that. You can't double count. And you'll always know what you're double counting is if you put little circles around what you're doing, there'll always be one number that you'll have two circles around. That'll indicate that you've counted those numbers, that 34 twice. You've counted them when you got the 583. You counted them again to get the 69. You don't want to do that. You don't want to double count anything. So I subtracted them. Another way of doing it is I could have gone 583 out of 1127 on my men. And then when it, it came count, came time to count my heavy smokers, I could have said, hey, I'm just going to use 35. I'm not going to count that 34. I'm not going to go 69. I'm just going to say 35. Notice 69 subtracted 34 gives you the 35, in this case, women. All right. So you, you either count them twice and then subtract or maybe just don't double count from Jump Street. All right. But I use these little circles to kind of pinpoint what I'm, what I'm doing. Numbers 10 and 11 were interesting in that they didn't give you a table. So I actually created my own table here. You will not see one like this on a test. I heaven forbid I have you do a table. You want to find a probability that a person answered yes or was a male. How many people answered yes? Here's a, the yes people right here. Total of 84 out of 157. Uh, and added with... Uh, males, how many males were there? There were 26, uh, 26 total out of 1157. But here's the deal. You know, these were my men. These were the people, or is it men? Yeah, 84. And these were the people who answered yes. All right. I've already counted these 14 people as males. I don't want to count them again as answering yes. So I did, I added the males plus the yes people. Then I, I subtracted the double count, the 14 people here. Maybe what I could have done is taken 84 over 157. And when it came time to count the men, I maybe could just have said 12 because I didn't want to count the 14 more than once. Make your mind up. You either double count and subtract or you don't count from Jump Street. 
Eat away, eat away. And we were all drawing. Okay, fantastic. Finally figured how to do that. And we still got this thing here. Give me a second, yeah, apparently I don't know why I did that. All right, number 11, here again, they didn't provide you with a shot. I did. You're looking for the probability you pick somebody in the 18 to 22 age range and did not smoke. How many people are in the 18 to 22 range? There's a total of 183 out of a total of 422. All right, those are the people within age 18 to 22. Or about the non-smokers. The non, well, here again, the non-smokers were 307 out of 442. But notice, in getting the 183, I counted the 124. In counting the people who were non-smokers, I counted the 124 again. I don't want to double count. All right, so... Yeah, to get the 183, I added these. Well, I did the wrong number there. I'm looking for. Yeah. I'm trying to draw something here. It's just not working out for me. Still want to clear all my drums. Hmm. All right, these are the these are the toughest problems. Now, I did what ten and eleven. I got to go back to twelve. Yeah. You got a hundred employees. Um, were asked how to get to work. Um, either how, how to get to work. They either drove alone, took a bike, they carpooled, or public transportation. And um, you wanted to know the problem tells me about people working full time and part time. So here's what we're, we're looking for here. It says, find a probability of getting someone who carpools, who carpools or someone who works full time. Well, how many people carpool? Well, carpool, there is these six people there and those nine people, there are 15 out of 100 who carpool. How many people work full time? We got seven people here, four people there, 30 people here and six people there. 47 but wait a minute these six people all right they also carpool so i counted them once already as being carpool people and i'm about to count them again as being full-timers no you only count these people once you either count them as being a full-timer or a person who carpools so what i did here is i subtracted those six people because i counted them twice i could have done that or maybe when i was adding up my full-timers i would have said seven plus four plus thirty 41, I wouldn't have counted those six. It, by not counting them saves me the hassle from subtracting at the end. So you make the decision, either you double count and then subtract or just don't count those extra people from Jump Street. In that case there, you would have gone seven plus four plus 30 for 41. Hey, notice 47 minus six gives you the 41. Uh, probability of rolling a three or a five. Well, these guys, there is no double count. You can't roll a three and a five at the same time. So there's no subtraction necessary. What's the probability of rolling a three? Well, it's one chance in six. There's six sides on the die. Only one of the sides is a three. Added with, what's the probability of me rolling a five? Well, there's only one five on a die out of a total of six. So it's either this or that, one six plus one six. But I'm not worrying about double counting because I you can't have a three and a five at the same time. All right, these guys were disjoint, mutually exclusive. They can't happen at the same time. You get a deck of uh, 52 cards, but you're probably are drawing a face card or a four. Well, these guys are disjoint. A card can't be a four and a face card at the same time. How many face cards are there in the deck? Jack, queen, and king in each suit. Clubs, hearts, diamonds, and spades. There's 12 face cards. How many fours are there in the deck? 
four clubs, four diamonds, four hearts, four spades. So I'm taking the first number of face cards, favorable over total, adding it with a number of cards in the deck that have the number four, and there's no double count. Notice there's no need of doing any subtraction. These events are disjoint. There is no double count because you can't have a face card and a four at the same time. A bag contains five red, three blue, and one green marble. Fine, probably of not blue. Well, these five reds aren't blue, and that one green is not blue. So the six not blue ones out of a total of nine, five, three, and one, favorable over total. Six of them were not blue. Six over nine, the lowest terms. That's an easy one, two thirds. All right, here's a tough problem here. These at least one. You've got to do this. To find a probability of at least one, it's one minus the probability of none. He says you got six uh, recently, um, six, well, first of all, a study of a certain college shows that 45% of the school graduates find a job in their, in their chosen field after graduation. Well, think about this. If 45 find a job, then the remaining 40, uh, if 55 find a job, 45% don't find a job. Find a probability among seven recent graduates, at least one. At least one could be one or two or three or four or five or six or seven. We don't know how to do that. So we say one minus the probability of none of the seven finding a job. Well, if 55% find a job, then 45% um, don't find a job. The first person doesn't find a job and the second and the third and the fourth, the fifth, the sixth and the seventh. So it's 0.45 to the seventh power. But remember, you're using the complement rule. You subtract that from the whole number one. That's the only way you can do a, at least one problem. The probability of at least one is one minus the probability of none. No one finding a job, 0.45%. All right, this one wasn't so bad because it was percentages. If you recall, when we're calculating this, if we're giving percentages, we treat these events as being... Um, independent. I was able to use this 0. 0.457 times. All right, independent events. Now watch what happens here, a little different. You have a sample of four calculators from a group of 16 that are defective and 30 with no defects. Once again, he's omitted to tell me how many total, but how hard is it to me at 16 that have defects with 30 that don't have defects? I've got a total of 46 calculators. What's the probability of at least one being defective? The probability of at least one being defective is one minus the probability that are, none of them are defective. Well, I have 30 that have no defects out of 46. I pull that one to the side. I've got 20, 29 with no defects out of a total of 45. And then 28 out of, well, this is, this is actually wrong. I, I thought I had to fix this. I thought, so please make them, if when you're looking at this, I'm telling you right now, this is a mistake. This is 29 out of, 30 out of 46 is correct. 29 out of 45 is correct. My apologies, this should have been 44. And this guy here should have been 27 out of 43. I thought I had made the correction on this. The answer works out, but you can see what happened here. I didn't subtract one from 45 to get 45. I took one from 29 to get 28. I took one from 28 to get 27, but I didn't subtract one from the 44 to get 43. So please, if you see this, that's what's going on here. I, I made a boo-boo, my bad, my bad. Apologize for that. The answer did work out right. All right, here's another one here where we're given percentages. I like percentages. Well, it's not even a percentage, it's a decimal, but a decimal is in reality can be expressed as a percentage. He's not giving me raw accounts here. I got six people and I combine their uh, blood samples into one mixture and it'll test negative if all of them are negative. If one or more are positive, the mixture is gonna test positive. They do this a lot in industry. Instead of checking each person individually, running it to a, um, the blood test, they take six samples, they mix them all together. 
but the idea is hopefully, you know, no one, uh, everyone's going to test negative. So what's the probability that the mixture will test positive? It'll test positive if at least one of the people test positive. How do I calculate that? The probability of at least one testing positive is one minus the probability that no, none of the six test positive. They're all negative. Well, if testing positive is 0.11, testing negative must be one minus that or 0.89, six times. The first person tested negative and the second person negative and the third. And the reason I was able to use this 0.89 is because he's given me not raw accounts. He's given me basically decimals, which are percentages. I can get away with it. I don't have to do any subtraction like I did in the previous problem. I can use this 0.89 six times, all right? So as an example of, even though this, uh, this problem is theoretically a dependent problem, I can treat it as being independent. So that's a lot. I know I'm beaten. Um, you may be tired just listening to me. So be aware that one problem, that's the first time, you know, I do make mistakes because I'm even like anybody else, but um, I thought I had fixed that one, but I didn't. So, I got 838. So that was, I did fairly well getting through all that. Any questions about tomorrow's test? I was online. I was on uh, Zoom Friday. I had zero people. I stood on for 15 minutes. And I understand that people have work schedules, whatever. But I've gotten like zero questions. So apparently you guys must be ready because no one's emailing. No one's even thought about using the discussion board. So, you know, I don't want to get negative, but I think I've shared enough emails with you, giving you the stuff. I can't study for you. I can do my best to present the material. But if you have no questions, I can't, I can't ask and answer the question myself. Just impossible. So apparently no one's got nothing to say. If that's the case, um, log on tomorrow. Make sure you block out at least a couple of hours. In past courses, people have finished with it. You know, some people finish mass. I mean, I, I had people that finished in 35 minutes. Big deal. I mean, that's them. If you take two and a half hours, that's up to you. There's no extra points for finishing fast. Whatever time you get the time, take as much time as you need. Just make sure you do it in one sitting and um, you don't walk off and uh, do something else and think you can come back to it. Pick a time in the day that you're going to have two and a half hours. And here again, have all your materials ready for them. In fact, let me show it to you. What I've been talking about. Let me share my screen here. I had a question about um, finding variance for a given set of data. Variance, variance is not given on your calculator. All right. You put the numbers in the list. You go to one variable stat, calculate. You find S of X. S of X is the standard deviation. You with me? Yeah. Take that number and you simply square it. I remember one problem where the standard deviation came out to be eight and you squared eight and the correct answer was eight times eight or 64. Remember that one? Yeah, I'm looking at that one right now. Yeah. In other words, the calculator does not give you a var variance. Is, is used in some things in statistics, but what it is, it's so whacked out because the, the um, labeling is square feet and square miles and square inches, okay? This is why to take the if you if you knew the variance you would take the square root to find the standard deviation, but your calculator does not give you the variance. It gives you the standard deviation. So you work in reverse. You have to square. You square the standard deviation that gives you the variance. Standard deviation on your calculator is s of x. Is that good? Yeah. Thank you. That clears that up. Okay. Who am I speaking to? By the way, I can't. Uh, Teddy. No, you're not Teddy. I know who Teddy is. That's not you. Sure. I'm just messing with you. All right. What I wanted to say was this. Are you seeing my screen? Yep. All right. Here's what I was saying. Even though, you know, I've moved on because by rights, you've got a homework. See, well, me, in fact, let me go into student view because this is going to confuse you. 
right now, this is current. Current is tonight's homework, which goes into section four, three. In fact, we want to watch this video, how to convert a decimal to a fraction. All right, you may want to watch that because you may have some problems where you have to convert it to a fraction. So watch that video. But the idea is tonight's homework deals with section four, three. Four, three will not repeat, not be on the exam. But that doesn't mean you, you can sleep on this because come Wednesday, you're going to have another assignment. All right. So even though you're preparing for the test, don't sleep on the fact that today is Monday and Monday you got a homework assignment. Here again, I don't apologize for this because you know what you were getting yourself into. You know, the good news is you, you knock this course out in five weeks. The bad news is you got to do five weeks of work. You got to do 15 weeks of work in five weeks. But, you know, my experience has been over the years is that the grades are really, they're better than people who take the 15 weeks because people that take a five week course are motivated. All right. As a whole, you guys are motivated students. By that, I mean, you're going to do well. At least my experience has been that summer courses, um, the grades are great. They, you people knock it out. I mean, you know, you got to do it and you do it. So it's to your, uh, to your credit. Now, here's what I was saying about um, back, going back to chapter three and chapter four. Here are all the solutions, right? Make sure you have these. I don't say you've got to print them out, but at least have them on your computer, all right? So you can look at, if you're having a problem with something, go back to a problem that we did for homework. Those are chapters one and two and three. And then this is the solutions to chapter four. All right, maybe helpful to you know to look at this guy too. This is the one where um, if you're not familiar with a deck of cards, what constitutes a club, a spade, a face guard, face cards, you know, there's three face cards in every suit. And this one here is very important. These are the 36 different ways that you can um, the outcomes when you roll two die. You know, someone says, Hey, what's the probability of me rolling a uh, a 10 well it could be a four and a six a five and a five or a six and a four so favorable over total if i can draw this would be one two three ways the uh you know the biggest the number that comes out the most is a seven you get a one and a six a two and a five a three and a four a four and a three uh five and a two and a six and a one. There are six different ways, six out of 36 ways of rolling a seven. If you've ever gone to a casino, you've played, you played craps, you know, seven on the first roll is great. After your number comes up, you roll a seven, you lose. And why it's seven? Because there's more ways of getting a seven and then anything else. Okay, anything else. All right. Anything else? I don't mind sitting here looking at you folks, but it's 845. I got other things to do. And you guys are just going to look at me. So or not look at me, whichever. As they say, if, who speaks French here? Anybody speak French? Anybody speak English? OK. Yes. English, yeah, good. French? Born chance on the test. Born chance. You. Born chance meaning good luck. Um, make sure you know that Monday's homework has already been assigned. And then Wednesday's homework will be. We will not meet on Wednesday because we've met tonight. But I will be on face, Facebook. Yeah. I will be. Tell them tired. Um, I will be on uh, office hours on Friday. And I know some people can't make it. But I do log on. And if no one's there, I at least stay on 15 minutes. And if no one shows up, I got, you know, I got things to do too, like we all do in life. All right. Good luck. If I have, if I have any last minute questions, is it okay to what do you contact? think? Katrina, what do you, you know the answer to that already, don't you? Okay. You know the answer. Come on, Katrina. After all the years we've I been just wanted to make sure. Oh, come on, Katrina. Enough's enough. I mean, I don't mind going along with you, but come on. Yeah, the short answer is yes, Katrina. I get back to you more than I get back to my wife. <laughs> thank you <laughs> very jealous of you she thinks you and i got something going on <laughs> please tell her we don't <laughs> i don't even leave the house how's that yeah okay 
Brenda, she said, Katrina says, we don't have a thing. Hi, <laughs> oh, Katrina. Relax, breathe. I'm trying. I know you're trying. I know you're trying. All right, good night, everybody else. Yeah, Katrina, assume me. Alrighty. Well. Good night. Well, you know, Thank I you. If anything else, Katrina, you know good I get night. back to you. Good night. Thank good night. you. Good night. See you later. Bye-bye.